you and I are presently engaged in a desperate warfare. Did you realize that? <laughs> okay. Question is, are you equipped, prepared, or are you a sitting duck? You know, as we review our present predicament, our problems in America are not really financial. Any businessman knows that cash flow is a symptom, not a cause. And that's an indicator of more fundamental problems. Our most telling deficiencies are not military, despite the media's attempts to mask the deterioration uh, of our military in pursuit of political correctness. America is in moral freefall. We're victims of spiritual warfare, and that's where we are subject tonight. We have media masking the truth. We have courts without justice. We have anger replacing patriotism. We have schools deliberately dumbing down our youth. We've replaced our traditional heritage with multiculturalism, revisionism, and value relativism. Our government is now the purveyor of immorality. And are we surprised? Governments have always loved crises. Every dictator creates an external crisis to consolidate power. Governments love crises because they're a rationale for increased budgets and stealing our freedoms, subjugating the population. In our country long ago, they discovered that the social crisis can serve the same purpose as military ones. But there's one insight that may plug a missing link. The insight is that immorality creates social crises. So is it any surprise that governments have an enormous incentive to promote immorality, which creates the crisis, which gives them the excuse to increase their budgets and so forth? Now, I'm going to suggest you and I are living in a period that I'm going to call the age of deceit. Our schools inculcate our children with the myth of evolution, that their existence is a result of a cosmic accident, and uh, then we wonder why they have no sense of destiny or any self-esteem. Our scientific establishments continue to promote this falsehood, despite abundant evidence that it no longer fits the known facts. You know, our government continues to disseminate disinformation to promote its pursuit of a socialist agenda. And it seems to us at times that our investigative institutions seem to devote the resources to cover-ups rather than to pursuit of truth and justice. So for the average citizen, there is evidence, he's evidence, he's more angered than patriotism. Now, the question is, from a biblical insight, who is the God of this world? Satan. And what's his primary weapon? Deceit. Right? So why are we surprised? So we are engaged in a warfare, and our most urgent warfare for our families and ourselves and, and our community and our country is uh, the spiritual warfare. How do you deal with it? I turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Simple sentence, but let's look at it very carefully. Be strong. That verb is in the present tense, the passive voice, and the imperative mood. The present tense, what it really says is be continually strong. It's not a once-for-all thing. It's a con continual, present tense thing. It's passive voice, which means you are the subject. You receive the action. And it's in the imperative mood. It's a command. To rephrase that then in our vernacular, allow yourself to be continually made strong by the Lord in the strength of his might. His might, the kratai, it's a power that overcomes resistance, the same uh, thing that's used in Christ's miracles, and uh, it's the power of his inherent strength. Now, what does this really mean? How do we, how do we, uh, what is involved? How do we do this? Well, verse 11 continues the thought, put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wilds of the devil. The form of the Greek imperative, put on, indicates that believers are responsible for putting on God's, not your own, a full armor, not part of it. Paul is going to mention this twice. Here in verse 13, he's going to say, the whole armor. And when you're going to battle, you don't just pick your favorite piece or two. You want the whole armor of God. That's emphasized here again and again. And the, the, the panoplyon was uh, uh, all the armor and weapons together were called the hopla. And, you're, and there's a sense of urgency in this. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wilds of the devil. How can you stand without his armor? 
It's amazing how many of us, if we have the perception concern of spiritual warfare, don't go to take the next step. You need to recognize that you need very special tools, and that's what Paul is going to enumerate for us here shortly. See, in our own strength, we are no match for the adversary. It's not an intellectual battle. I don't care how smart you are. He's smarter than you are. And you can go down any list of possibilities you'll discover. He outclasses you in each one. You need to have God's protection. And uh, the purpose of putting on God's armor is, in fact, to be able to stand against his schemes or stratagems. Morthodias, or the word from, we, from which we get the word method, if you will. It's only used here in the New Testament and one other place in chapter 4. We must be completely armed. We're going to go through a list here, but you need to recognize that the entire list is essential. Because we are already on enemy turf. We are already on enemy turf. Now, in this chapter, we're going to discover that Paul provides us a detailed description of spiritual armor. And because of the idioms he uses, most commentators presume that he's drawing these idioms from a Roman soldier that he is chained to. We, we do know that in Acts 28, in 2 verses 16 and 20, he was indeed chained while he was on house arrest. Now, it's, uh, it's interesting that most people presume that these chains were to keep Paul from escaping. But if you know anything about Paul, his point of view would be that's to keep the soldier from escaping. Can you imagine being chained to Paul for an entire shift? You know, I'm reminded every time I go through this, I'm always reminded of Woody Allen's classic crack. He said that hell is being stuck in an elevator with a life insurance salesman, you know. Well, you get the spirit of, of the humor there, but I can imagine among the Roman soldiers the idea of being chained to this fanatic must have been an interesting experience. Well, in Philippians chapter 4, verses 21 and 22, we can draw the inference that many of these got saved. By being chained to Paul, they discovered who Christ really was and uh, received Christ in their lives. They were saved. The word in Caesar's household is translated in English. The Greek implies it was his praetorian guard that was involved. But actually, even though most people who comment on this passage will draw their idioms, and we will too, some of them, from the Roman uh, counterparts to get a feeling for what that armor is, because it's not the kind of thing you and I see every day, I would be remiss in not pointing out to you that these same idioms are used in the Old Testament. That um, if you look at Isaiah 59, it might be useful for us just to get a flavor. Let's take one of these other places, but let's take Isaiah chapter 59 as a quick peek. In Isaiah, and this, of course, is hundreds of years before, in chapter 59, verse 17, it says, He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation upon his head, and he put on garments of vengeance for clothing, was clad with zeal as a cloak, and so forth. If you're sensitive or you take a computer or a concordance and chase these things down, you'll discover the idioms that Paul is dealing with are alluded to in the Old Testament. And the real point is that the Holy Spirit is consistent in the way he uses these idioms. They're not idioms of convenience because there's a soldier there. They seem to carry meaning that's even deeper. One of the exciting things you need to discover for yourself is that we have indeed in our lap 66 books that were penned by 40 different guys over thousands of years, and yet are in integrated message. Every number, every place name, every detail is there by design. And the origin of that message is from outside the domain of time altogether, and that you can prove. And that's the staggering implication of the Scripture. It really is the Word of God. They're discovering with computers all kinds of structures underlying the text that demonstrate this, and we'll get into some of that a little bit. But so when you see things like these idioms that are used consistently through the Scripture, it's another subtle the fingerprint of the Holy Spirit, that his, his use of idioms, often puns, are consistent. But uh, in verse 12, we have our strategic intelligence report. We're in a battle. First thing you need to know is what G2 there is. What, what are we up against? Paul tells us, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, if you're, if you're a student of, of the New Testament, you know that these principalities and powers 
are terms from the Greek that refer to ranks of angels. They're not just theological abstractions. These are terms that are used in a number of passages. I'll let you chase them down on your own. Uh, you'll discover are, in fact, uh, ranks of angels. And in this case, of course, we're talking about what you might call a spiritual mafia. You want to talk about organized crime, boy, this is big stuff. So spiritual warfare is not just a matter of contending against godless philosophers or crafty gurus or Christ-denying cultists or neo-pagan rulers, but against a highly organized army of demonic forces and battalions of fallen angels. Sp really spooky stuff. It's interesting how most churches are very comfortable talking about Jesus Christ, the teacher, Jesus Christ, the ethical advocate, Jesus Christ, the great example, etc., etc. So they're very uncomfortable. You start talking about Satan or demons and these kinds of things, it sounds medieval, it sounds uh, spooky, it sounds a, it's not a popular topic in some groups. And so somehow you get in other groups, it's perhaps uh, excessively popular. But in any case, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4 is a place you can refer to for some of these things. But let's move on. See, the real issue that you and I have to grapple with, you and I tend to think that this physical world is the real reality, understandably. But if you study the Scripture, you know that our physical world is really the result of unseen spiritual battles. If I said that this podium is solid, most of us feel, gee, that's solid. And yet, if you know anything about atomic physics, you know that in each atom, there's less than one part in a million that's solid. The rest is an electrical simulation. There's more space than solid by a factor of 10 to the 6th to 1. Now we'll go through all that arithmetic and bore you to death. But the point is, this feels solid because it's really an electrical simulation. If you, if you know anything about particle physics, you quickly discover that. Scientists today point out that we don't live in three dimensions or even four using time. We live in ten. And on it goes. And you know, we have a briefing pack called Beyond Perception, which attempts to relate the latest discoveries of particle physics with our insights from the Bible. It's amazing how contemporary the Bible really is. But let's examine, there's a couple of places in the Scripture where we get a glimpse of this unseen reality, what I'll call the real reality, invisible to us normally. And let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 6 for one of my favorite examples of this, because it's brief and to the point, and yet will be illuminating for us. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we're in the days of Elisha, and the adversary of Israel in those days was Syria. Seems like not much has changed, huh? But we'll pick it up about verse 8. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God, that is Elisha, sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for there the Syrians are come down. In other words, the king of Syria would make a plan, but Elisha would always tip off the king of Israel. So we get down to Verse 10, the king of Israel sent to the place where the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there not once or twice. In other words, many times. This wasn't just a one-time thing. In fact, it gets to be a real problem. Verse 11, therefore the heart of the king of Syria was very troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, will ye not now show me which of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, the king of Syria thinks he's got a mole in his camp. Every time he makes a plan, somehow the king of Israel finds out and eludes him. And this happens consistently enough, the king of Syria thinks that he's got a spy in his own staff. Verse 12, one of the servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet who is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. This is the first biblical record of a phone tap. <laughs> but that's the spirit of the thing, you see. Somehow Elisha, by the spirit of God, knew the thoughts of what was going on, would always warn his benefactor, the king of Israel. Verse 13, so the king of Syria says, Go and spy where he is, that, I, that is where Elisha is. Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, is he in Dothan? Therefore sent he there horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city round about. Now Dothan's a small village. That's where Elisha is hanging his head at the time. And overnight, the place is surrounded by the Syrian army. The passage of interest starts in verse 15 through 17, that, that when the servant of the man of God, now when Elisha has his manservant, his orderly, his whatever, he got up early. He was risen early. 
and gone forth, behold, a host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. That must have terrified the young guy. Got up in the morning, looked out, they realized the city is surrounded by hostile combatants. The servant said unto him, that is, unto Elisha, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He's in panic. Verse 16, Elisha answered and said, Fear not, for they who are with us are more than they who are with them. Which I imagine struck the, the, the young man as a platitude. I imagine he was thinking something like, Sure, boss, but I can hear them revving their engines. They're out there. In verse 17, Elisha prays, and I can almost hear his impatient disdain. I, Elisha prayed, said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. In other words, I can almost visualize him annoyed to be bothered. Lord, show him what's going on. Hey, boss, let him in on it. That's the spirit of it as I see it. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. They were in this village. They're suddenly surrounded by the muscle of the region. I mean, these guys are mean dudes. The young man's understandably terrified because he's looking at what you and I, what, well, excuse the expression, the natural, huh? Is Pat, boss, what do we do? Those that are with us are more than those with them. Yeah, yeah, but there they are. Lord, show them. And suddenly he sees, he's allowed to perceive the power of the spiritual hosts that were allocated to protect Elisha. Kind of neat stuff. Now, how many of you have a computer and use a word processor. Can I see a show of hands? Okay, that's most of you. know what? More than two-thirds of you. So the people that were with Daniel, verse 7, they fled to hide themselves. They're pretty terrified by this guy. So in verse 8, he's left alone. And um, so it turns out that um, he uh, is sustained. And uh, verse 12, he says, Then he said he to me, Fear not, Daniel. For from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Now, hang on a second. Get the picture. Daniel, 21 days ago, started this period of fasting and prayer. And this messenger was dispatched then. It took him, apparently, 21 days to arrive. What held him up? Verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, and for yet the vision is for many days. And he goes on to talk about it. He points, in other words, the messenger is saying, Daniel, I was dispatched three weeks ago. Yeah, I would have been fighting this guy. The prince, don't be misled. The prince, it isn't the literal prince, but we're not talking to Darius or Cyrus. We're talking about a spiritual power behind the Persian Empire. And the prince, it's the real prince, not the king you'd see, but it's the, the term here implies, uh, and I won't get it all out, but you can quickly prove if you understand the way da the book of Daniel and its exegesis. We're talking here about a spiritual being, an adverse spiritual being that this messenger's had to fight with for three weeks to get through. He's come then to give Daniel the vision. The vision will be described in chapters 11 and 12. But he points out, continuing here, the verse 19, then said, O man, speaking to Daniel, says, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened. By the way, you notice he does hear exactly what Paul does in chapter 6. To be strong is a command. It's not automatic. It's something you need to do. Daniel had to do it. In the presence of this angel, be strong. It's a command. And I was strengthened. He said, Lord, I let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then he said, He knowest thou why I come to thee? And now I will return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Greece shall come. But not, I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there's none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. A couple of small points here. First of all, Michael is one of the named angels. 
Gabriel is a named angel. We always see Gabriel on a mission of annunciation with respect to the Messiah. In the Old Testament, every time he shows up, he's announcing something about the Messiah. In the New Testament, he is also. Michael is always a military commander on behalf of Israel. We infer by just studying all the places they appear, they're always, they appear to have a very definitive job description. And that apparently is Michael's allusion. But what, he's, what this messenger is saying, look, guy, it took me 21 days to get through because I was held up by the Prince of Persia. I'm going to give you this vision, but when I'm through with you, I've got to go fight him. And after him, the Prince of Greece will come. Now, if you've been studying the book of Daniel, you know that one of the things Daniel lays out are all the Gentile empires from Babylon, when Daniel was deported, all the way until the end of time. And there are only four. Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome in two phases. And then the Lord's setting up his kingdom. Very important study, very important book to understand. It's one of the few places we really get an insight into Gentile history in advance. But the point is, after the prince of Persia comes the prince of Greece. But this is kind of interesting. You were talking 21 days here. The prince of Greece didn't come for 200 years. What's going on? See, now, what one can probably presume that the time dimension on their side is different than ours. There's no reason to presume they're similar. For a lot of reasons, time is a physical dimension. Change with mass acceleration gravity. Is an angel subject to gravity? I don't think so. Is his time domain the same? I don't think so. He's not, he's not God. Don't misunderstand the attributes of God. God is outside the, you know, the time dimension altogether. But uh, that doesn't mean angels are. Because they're created beings also. But they're not necessarily subject to the same dimensions we are. But the point is, this is in one of these spooky glimpses. Just a glimpse. But the text suggests that there is a demonic power, not just a prince, but probably an organization with a prince, that's behind the world empires. Clearly behind Persia, apparently behind Greece. Was there one behind Rome? Boy, I think so. Was there one behind Hitler? Boy, I think so. Is there one behind the United States? Biblically, you'd be justified in holding that view. Anyway, that's, uh, that's what we're dealing with here. We're not dealing with a physical reality that you and I experience, which is a, a small subset of the real reality. Scientists say that particle physicists tell us that you and I live in four dimensions that we can sense, like with height and time. But there are six others that are curled in less than 10 to the minus 33 centimeters that are inferable only by indirect means. But you, you discover these if you start studying uh, quantum physics. And the whole theory of uh, existence today has to do with super strings. Because they discover now reality is not local. All particles of the universe know about each other immediately. It's very, some very strange experiments, and we'll get that here. But the point is, as you really study modern physics, these ideas seem much less strange than they would perhaps to uh, someone not current in modern science. But it's interesting how as we discover more and more about our universe, it's interesting the Bible has anticipated all along. And Mark Eastman and I did a book called The Creator Beyond Time and Space, which highlights the transcendence of our Creator and, and how modern science has vindicated the biblical perspective. But that's, again, something we can take on another evening. Let's move on. We're at verse 13. Paul continues, Wherefore, take unto you, here again he says, the whole armor. If you're going to play this game, boy, you better not be, you better not have a weakness. Because forces malevolent to you are going to know about it and take advantage of it. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. He's going to list the specific pieces of armor, but before I go on, let me mention something that may surprise you. First of all, if you're in Jesus Christ, if you accept him as your Savior, you are in this warfare. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, you're part of the enemy's pawns already. Powerless. But if you're in Jesus Christ, you're part of the warfare. Let me tell you a surprising area that you're vulnerable in. It's called your marriage. One of the things that anyone in the ministry will tell you, and you're all in the ministry, by the way, whether you're on salary for a ministry or whether, you know, whatever walk God has called you to, you are, if you're in Christ, a member of the body of Christ, you have a role in the body. One of your vulnerabilities in that body is your marriage. When your marriage is solid, Satan has a tough time getting at you. If your marriage is not, if there's a hole, a weakness, 
that's a, an area of vulnerability. And uh, we've talked a lot about that in this epistle already. We've talked a lot about that in our uh, study of the Corinthian epistles. But uh, we'll move on right now. Okay, verse 14 has the first two elements. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Let's take that part of it so far. Doesn't that sound glib? Gird your loins with truth. First of all, this term of truth. Remember what Pilate said? In a cynical rhetorical fashion, is what is truth? Few of us have probably ever raised the question ourselves. I don't know how I won't ask for a show of hands. But a moment's consideration will quickly reveal that that's your most precious treasure to be coveted. Truth. Ask any investor on Wall Street, and he'll tell you the most precious thing available to him is true information, not rumors or noise or odds and ends. Information, especially to an investor or a military commander, fill in the blank, whoever you like. Knowledge is power. Truth is the key to success, fulfillment, victory, or any worthwhile goal. And the pursuit of truth is part of, or should be one of your primary endeavors. Now, we live in a very fabulous century, which has ushered in astonishing changes in technology. And yet, strangely, it has also ushered in new depths of darkness, with devastating wars, monstrous new weapons, and yielding the bloodiest, most revolutionary, most unpredictable century in human history. What an irony, isn't it? Now, perhaps the most fearsome change in our world today is the abandonment of truth. It is the commitment of most of the American universities to deny the existence of truth. Everything's relative. There is no absolute truth. See, in a cultural war, truth is always the first casualty. And yet, determining truth it should be the cornerstone of our living. What a man believes today, he puts into practice tomorrow. To believe in the wrong model of history or the wrong purpose of living will plunge us into grievous errors, great tragedies, devastating consequences. Yet the correct, true view of God, man, history, is the key to sanity, survival, and fulfillment for each of us. Now, most of us are born along by information that's pandered to us by others who are inimical to our interests. Most of the assumptions of our society, our nation, our families demand re-examination. Relax, we won't go through them all here tonight. But um, the shock is, as you start to examine these, most of them are false. In fact, most of them from deliberate deceit. So by renewing our minds and challenging the lies that drive our society, we can achieve a better destiny than the fate toward which we would stumble otherwise. Let's get back to this example. He says, gird your loins with truth. The Roman belt was about six to eight inches wide, all the body armor and weapons were hooked to it. So you see, the truth is the, the binding thing. And it, because of that, it's the one that gave the soldier freedom of movement. Just as truth gives you freedom with self, others, and with God. Notice that that was all prepared before the battle. You don't go trying to pull your pants up or whatever when you're already engaged. And uh, you can't postpone gaining combat knowledge once you need it. It's got to be preparation. Now, of course, another definition of truth, there's many, we could usher up many definitions of truth, but my favorite is one my wife suggested to me. That's when the word and the deed become one. The ultimate truth is the word of God becomes true as he fulfills his promises. It's interesting to see the contrast between the God of the Bible, and the God of the Quran. The Allah of the Quran is capricious, unpredictable. They make a big point of that. Read that, unreliable. The God of the Bible, many of us take this for granted because we get introduced to covenant authority. The God of the Bible, all through the Scripture, makes promises and keeps them. That's one of his major attributes. Now, the ultimate truth is the fulfillment of the promise he gave Adam and Eve in the garden, that of a Redeemer. And the ultimate truth is, of course, Jesus Christ, who he declares that. John 14, 6, 
where Jesus himself was, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That period. Unless we misunderstand that he amplifies this, no man comes to the Father but by me. That's a strong statement. Very uncomfortable to many. Boy, that sounds narrow. Jesus said it was. Jesus said, straight as the gate, narrow is the way. Right? If you've got a broad gate and a lot of other people go in there with you, you've got the wrong gate. And also, I'd want to leave this point without pointing out that God desires the truth where? Psalm 51, 6, in the inward parts. What's the ultimate, most dangerous source of lies? Ourselves. Ourselves. And one of the things uh, I encourage you to really deal with is to understand your own architecture. Not, the, not your hardware architecture, not an anatomy book. And not the kind of architecture that is promoted by Freud in his writings, which after all is only a man. But rather, the, way you, the architecture of your software. We have a breathing package called the architecture of man, which goes into all that. But better yet, I encourage you to get my wife's book called The Way of Agape, which not only deals with the architecture, software architecture, as revealed in the scripture, but also practically how to deal with that. So I urge you to get that and, and if necessary, its sequel, Be Transformed, which focuses on Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, where Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do you do that? How do you renew your mind? That's your challenge to go on. Let's move on, finish verse 14. He, uh, Paul lists the second element of the armor. And having the breastplate of righteousness. Let me ask you a question. What is your most important stewardship? You have many stewardships. You have a business. You have a checkbook. You've got assets of different kinds that require custodianship. You have, you have different... What is your most important stewardship? The guys will probably think careers. The wife will nudge you in the elbow and say, no, it's the family. There's even one thing more important than that. Your most important stewardship, bar none, is your heart. Where is your heart really? That's the question. Now, it's interesting that the breastplate is the part of the Roman's armor. It was typically bronze backed with leather. The breastplate was intended to secure the vitals. A successful penetration of the breastplate was typically fatal. You could lose a hand or an arm or something else, but a piercing of the breastplate was typically all she wrote, guys. And um, the breastplate covered what? The heart. So just as a soldier's breastplate uh, protected his chest from the enemy's attacks, a sanctifying, righteous living guards a believer's heart from assaults of the devil. And we could go from here to Romans 6.13 or 14.17. Even Isaiah 59, the passage you read, sp spoke of the breastplate of righteousness. It's talking here about two different things, the integrity and uprightness in your personal life. And uh, David talks about that in Psalm 7. Put that in your notes and look at it at your leisure. We're talking about personal integrity. And this is we can get from here into this whole issue of concept of being a fiduciary and uh, loyalty to other Christians, to your family, and to your employer, and so forth. Everywhere you look, we have abandoned the concept of the sanctity of a commitment. Someone asked Norman Schwarzkopf, what is the biggest problem in America? He paused a moment and said, integrity. That problem is everywhere. We see it in our marriages, the divorce rates and what have you. We see it in business. We also see it in our personal lives. And let me tell you candidly, going having gone from the corporate world into the ministry, I'm appalled at the ethics, not the morality, that problem's everywhere. I'm talking about the ethics. Some of that's due to poor training. Some of that's due to just uh, an absence of appropriate concepts of loyalty in the ministry world. But the other dimension here that's even more important to emphasize is the righteousness that will protect you is not yours. 
while there is a call to our personal righteousness, and we need to emphasize that, the righteousness that will protect you is not yours, it's his. His imputed righteousness to you if you're in Christ. Second Corinthians 5.21 makes that point. His righteousness is essential. And the righteousness of Christ imputed to us is what makes our breastplate impervious against the attacks of Satan. And the apostle will explain this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 8, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and so forth. But let's move on to verse 15. Paul continues, And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, this is kind of a strange one. The Romans had greaves, often of brass or some other material, that were part of their military armor. The use of them were to defend against um, gall traps and sharp sticks and other kinds of encumbrances that, the, that their adversary put in their way. Any of you who have been trained in boxing or wrestling or in hand-to-hand -hand or in other uh, martial arts of various kinds knows the essential nature of a proper footing. At the Naval Academy, you have, uh, for two years, you had boxing and wrestling, and then uh, uh, from that led to the hand-to-hand -hand courses. Let me tell you, you learn very quickly if your footwork ain't right. That's learning it the hard way, of course. Pun intended. Now, if you're fighting with swords, your first um, slip is probably your last. So the idea of footwork is something, if you've had any training in, the, in martial arts at all, you know it's important. Now, what Paul is saying is you need a new pair of shoes. What kind of shoes do you need? Shod, not with the gospel of peace. That would be sort of understandable. Here's a strange phrase here. It's shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. See, we need to prepare for our invasion of enemy territory. The initiative is ours. We're talking about an active offense here, not a passive defense. And remember, we're on enemy turf. Preparation of the gospel of peace. This is not something casual. It's not something you sort of sign up for once and for all thing. Preparation involves training. It involves preparation. In what? The gospel of peace. It's interesting, in Isaiah 52, 7, you've probably sung this in various forms as a hymn, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publish salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. And so the question you put in your notes is, do you have beautiful feet? Are you prepared to proclaim the gospel of peace? But let's get on to verse 16. Paul says, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The shield of faith. The Roman shield was about four feet high and about two and a half feet wide, curved typically. It was the maneuverable part of the armor. It was uh, overlaid typically with linen and leather and such, to, typically out of wood and then overlaid with leather and what have you, to uh, be able to withstand fiery arrows. It also protected, thus, the other parts of the armor. It's maneuverable. The integrity of the shield was essential. If you were in the barracks and you discovered it had a hole in it, you didn't go charge out in the battle. What did you do? You plugged the hole, right? You see? And you did this not during but before the battle. If you're out there fighting, it's too late. you got to do this beforehand. And diligence is the key to proper maintenance of a shield. You keep an eye on it. You examine it after each engagement. You look it over. See if there's any weaknesses, holes, and you repair them before you need them. Well, what about your faith? You say the shield of faith. If you have doubts, if you've got problems, with your perspective, biblical views. The time to fix those is now. If you've got a question about something you don't understand, pursue it. Find out. Do your homework. Don't be a wimp that has to be spoon-fed on the sidelines. Roll up your sleeves. Get a concordance. Get whatever other helps confer with members of the body, plug the holes. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't places that we all have some place that needs work. That's not my point. But if you've got some fundamental doubts, whether it be about creation or salvation by faith, any of the, the major issues, plug the holes. 
Don't wait for some pastor to spoon feed you. Do your homework. It's like any place else. As a businessman, you know that the market always rewards the diligent. The market always rewards the diligent. There's something else about Roman shields that I think is kind of interesting. The Roman shields were one of the pieces of the armor that could be used in combination. I think this is interesting. Visualize the shield being four feet high and about two and a half feet wide, slightly curved. Some of them had a bump in the middle, which is where their handle was for it. But the point is, it's basically a four foot high, two foot wide shield. They had a formation they called the tortoise formation. And 27 soldiers would line up this way. They'd have six in front and then three rows of seven each. And when they went in a tortoise formation, the front row would lock their shields in the front row. The rest of the guys would cover themselves from the top and the sides. And when they did this properly, it looked like a tortoise. It was like a walking tank. There's no way you could penetrate it because it was, in effect, sealed them into a, a protective shell. That's why the term tortoise is so descriptive. The way they practiced this to make sure they got it right is they'd go to tortoise formation and they would test it by running chariots over it. Imagine they learned pretty quickly how to do it right. Imagine. <laughs> I don't know if this is a proper application or not, but the thought that hits me is I'm intrigued with the body of Christ. Paul goes to great lengths in a number of his epistles, especially in Corinthians, about how the members of the body are diverse from one another. If you're not exhibiting your gifts in the body, you're denying the rest of us something God intended. And one of the things that we as a body should be doing is encouraging one another in our faith. There's probably an area you have a concern about or weakness. There's probably someone else in here who's done homework in that area would be glad to share it with you. Some of you have a hurt or a problem or, or a bitterness or something that's encumbering your spiritual growth. There's somebody nearby that God has placed there that will minister that. How many of you have gone through trials? About 10%, huh? <laughs> well, the rest of you are too weak to raise your hand. No, I, we all have. Now, there's a number of, we could go through a whole study of why God put you through trials. That's his way of growing you. No pain, no gain, so to speak. Very, very literally true. But one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons God put you through a trial is to equip you to minister to someone who's going through that now. So if you've gone through some particular experience in the past, one of the reasons God may have put you through that is to equip you to minister to the body in that area. Pray about it. Be sensitive to the Spirit and see what He said. Now, I don't want to leave the subject of the faith without pointing out that the key to faith, and we're not talking here about blind accepting something, not at all. Scripture says that we should be ready always to give every man a reason of the hope that is within you with all meekness of fear. When the Bible speaks of faith, it means faith in the Word of God. It's a form of trust in God. God dreams up a dozen ways to continually ask us, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Faith is trusting him as to what he said. Not something you imagine, not something you hope, something he said. Faith is based on knowledge of his word and trust in his word. And that's why, to me, in my engineering orientation, the great discovery in my life was the discovery that I had to make personally, and you need to make personally for you, is the integrity of the word. What I mean by this, first of all, in two ways, the integrity mechanically. 66 different books written by 40 guys who are thousands of years, yet we discover by examining it carefully that the text is engineered as an integrated message. It's got all kinds of codes and interconnection stuff. You, you see his fingerprints all over it. No number, no place name, no detail is there but by the supernatural engineering. And the second thing you discover once you've discovered that is that it had, had to have its origin from outside the time domain. Once you discover that, it elevates this book quite apart from all other books on the planet Earth. It's the only book that recognizes a transcendent creator. It's the only book that recognizes we live in more than three dimensions that we now know. It has anticipated virtually every major scientific discovery. It has no scientific errors. Those are preposterous statements, but all provable. All provable. 
You need to understand. You need to trust. You need to be equipped enough in your Scripture to be able to trust it. That's the key to your faith. It's not some kind of blind belief. Don't use the world's definition of faith here. And you want to resolve any doubts you have now before you need them. Verse 17 takes the next one. He says, and Paul says, take the helmet of salvation. Now, the helmet provided protection for the head. And uh, having your head protected gives you a sense of safety. The believer knows that the ultimate victory is certain. You need to know that the ultimate victory is certain. His assurance of that is a critical blessing. One of the most important aspects of your defense against Satan's attack is faith in your eternal security, that you are sealed and guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. Now, if you've got a problem with that, and I hope you do, because you won't resolve that until you've really examined the issue, there's all kinds of theological debates in this area, and you need to have them resolved for yourself. Don't trust me or anyone else. Trust the Scripture. We do have a briefing package called the Sovereignty of Man. The sovereignty of God is not a problem. God is God. He can do what He likes. The libraries are full of books on the sovereignty of God. That is not our difficulty. Our problem is the sovereignty of man, whether we realize it or not. Predestination or free will? Boy, the philosophy libraries are full of that issue. The theological library is no less. And uh, that leads to the theological controversy of Calvinism and Arminians. Both are correct in what they assert. Both are wrong in what they deny. And there is an easy answer to that if you understand it. It's not an insoluble dilemma. It's only an insoluble dilemma if you insist upon viewing it from within the time domain, which is a physical dimension. Once you recognize that God is outside time, the problem evaporates. And uh, I encourage you, if you have difficulties in this area, you either have had them and resolved them, or you will have, trust me. <laughs> And uh, we do have a brief, the sovereign, we, we chose to call it the sovereignty of man because it's a courtship. One proof of that is that out of this whole deal, Adam falls, God arranges a redemption that's available in Jesus Christ. Fantastic. God has gone to incredible lengths so that you and I might share an eternity with him. Let me tell you the punchline that blows me away. Out of the whole program, God doesn't get what he wants out of the deal. <laughs> wild. He is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance, he says. That's his desire. Will all come to repentance? No. But precious are those that do to him. So I encourage you, if you haven't gotten into the sovereignty of man issue or the Armenian Calvinism thing, it has many, many forms, but that's the basic issue. I encourage you to get those things resolved so they don't catch you at a bad time. Paul says, the second, the second letter to Timothy, chapter 1, he says, Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know in whom I have believed, and that I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Notice it's Christ's faithfulness that's the issue. Praise God. I know that all things work together for good. Remember that verse, Romans eight twenty eight. I have a tab in my Bible. I check it about once a day. Is it still there? Romans 8, 28, we all know the verse. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. What are the three most important words in that verse? The first three. And we know, not suspect, not hope, not believe, we know that all things work together for good. Unless you do, you're vulnerable. You're vulnerable. Hebrews 7.25 tells us that Jesus Christ's full-time job right now as we meet here tonight is to be praying for you. Boy, what a prayer partner that is. We could talk about faith, obviously, for a lifetime. The, the, the shield of faith. Verse 17, all continues, And the sword of the Spirit. And this is one of the idioms that we're probably all very familiar with. What is the sword of the Spirit? The Word of God. Many people have Bible covers. They call that their sheath, right? They often say, did you bring your sword? And so forth. We use that term all the time. Why? Because the Scripture in many places refers to the Bible, the Word of God, as the sword 
of the Spirit. So that's not an idiom unfamiliar to us. It's interesting, as we put on all this armor, you know, we got the breastplate, we got the greaves, and we got the sheet, all this. What's the last thing he picks up? His sword, right? Let me tell you something about the Roman sword. In those days, a typical sword was longer, sharpened on one edge. It had to be used with a cocked arm in a chopping motion, typically. The Roman army innovated a what was then an innovation. They adopted what was called a bachira. It was 24 inches long. It was short by those standards. It was sharpened on both edges. It uh, was a very revolutionary innovation with which they conquered the world, in part. In contrast to having to do it with a chopping motion, the legi Roman legionnaire could duck, catch his enemy off balance, close in, and thrust or cut from any position, winning the engagement at close quarters. It was a close quarters technique. In great contrast to Alexander's phalanx with the long spears and all that sort of stuff. This was a close-in combat weapon. Now let me... So it's an interesting analogy. Let me tell you something about the Machaira. Unless you've studied Roman military tactics, you wouldn't be aware of. The Machaira was a powerful weapon only if the user had been specially trained and had lots of practice. If you were just handed it, it's not obvious how you exploit it. The Roman legionnaires were trained in its uniquenesses. Took special training and uh, a lot of practice to use right, but used right, it guaranteed a win. It's interesting that Christ employed his sword three times in the Great Temptation. Remember, the, we all study the temptation of Christ. Each one was met by what? The Word of God, properly applied. Remember, Satan was, is great at quoting Scripture, or misquoting Scripture out of context, what have you. Pulpits of America are full of preachers who quote Scripture that are not biblically sound as far as the doctrines are concerned. How do you tell? By the whole counsel of God to do your homework. Remember what God, uh, God also says in Psalm 119, verse 11, Thy word have I hid where? In my heart, that I might not sin against thee. I am a great believer in Bible memory. I generally try not to use it from a pulpit because sometimes I may misquote it. That's why I try to even look it up even though I may think I know the verse. I sometimes say I have Alzheimer's disease. I sometimes go through. There are three things that happen when you get older. First is you lose your memory, and I forget the other two. <laughs> no, but all kidding aside, I think Scripture memory is very important. That's one reason I prefer the King James. Everybody says, gee, which translation is best? I've been through all the arguments, NIV, this, and West Scott, and Hort, that, and great, fine, all that. I've gone through the whole cycle. I've come back to the King James. Why? Because it's better? No, they all have problems. The good news about the King James is they're well documented. They're not just discovering them. They're well, they've got well-traveled ground. But that's not the reason. The real reason is I'd like to do my memory work in something I know will be around 20, 30 years from now. You know? I mean, I'd hate to have invested a lot of memory work in the, in the RSV. And I'm not too thrilled about the future of the NASB. So it's a good translation, all that. Hal loves it. But uh, uh, there's new ones coming. Right now, the big rage is the NIV. What happens when the ISB comes out and some of these others? Are they going to be better? Maybe. It's not that the King James has been around for 100 years. It's that I think it'll be around for another 100 years, should it be necessary. So that's just a view. Well, we could talk a lot about the authentication of God's Word by prophecy, by proving its origin is from outside time, by writing history in advance, and evidence of design, and that's a whole other study. Let's just move on because time is slipping away. We've talked up till now about the individual soldier's armor, but Paul brings up another aspect one of the most important aspects of a military engagement is proper ground support, interdiction, flanking fire, and direct assaults. We might call that artillery. Let's talk about your heavy artillery in spiritual warfare. That's in verse 18. Praying always with prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. When we studied the Thessalonian epistles, remember it said, pray without ceasing. What does it actually say in the Greek? It says, pray without ceasing. Very simple. Paul well, here again says, praying always, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereto with all perseverance and supplication for whom? All saints. Do you pray for all of us? Do you pray for your pastor? Do you pray for your congregation? Do you pray for your community? We meet every Tuesday morning. 
the pastors in this region, well, a good chunk of them, to pray for what? The region. Not competing with one another for my congregation versus your kind. None of that. It, it's delightful. As I travel across the United States, too often the local churches have a siege mentality. It's tragic. The good news is not here. There are pastors that meet once a week for Post Falls, for Coeur d'Alene. I meet with them. Delightful time. Delightful time. But Paul goes on. Uh, uh, and by the sea, this all goes beyond the personal armor. This is your heavy artillery. Artillery is like action at a distance. You can pray to affect a spiritual battle going on in Europe, Africa, China. I, I often share a speaking platform with Dave Hunt, and he loves to make the point that he believes there'd be more people raptured from China than the United States. That always gets audiences upset. Now, he says it because it's true. I would say it because it gets audiences upset. But anyway, <laughs> how can God use tainted vessels? We're all tainted vessels. It is uh, partly by the atmosphere of commitment among the staff, but also uh, because of prayer warriors. We have several hundred people across the United States praying for us regularly. We frequently put out a call. If anyone that feels led to do that, just register with us. We send them a special letter from time to time with special requests. We don't tell anyone else our financial needs, just our prayer warriors, so that if a check arrives, we ask the prayer warriors not to support us financially. We ask them to pray for us. Why do we do that? Because it's not the money we need as much as knowing it's God's will. We're not involved in any schemes to raise funds and all that. Like I'm not saying that's bad. That's just not our way. Because our problem isn't the money alone. Everybody has financial needs. Our real concern is it of the Lord. And uh, when we're suddenly faced with a, a bill of 14 grand for some piece of equipment we think we need, and a check arrives in the mail from someone we don't know for 14 grand, do you get the feeling it was God? You know, not because we put out a, you know, a request for it at all, et cetera. You, you get what I'm saying. So I encourage any of you in the ministry is to uh, undertake getting prayer support. If you're going to start a home Bible study, get a group praying for that home Bible study. In your own local congregation, make sure that you're participating for the Lord and Legion in this praying on a regular basis for that ministry, for that pastor, for that program, whatever you're doing. Crucial. Sounds so corny, so trite, but crucial. How crucial is it? Jesus always was praying. If you go through the gospel, notice here's God himself incarnate. Spending his time, how? In prayer, sometimes all night. Is it important? I'd say so. Yet it sounds so simple. So disarmingly simple, and yet how crucial it is. And notice he says these are requests for all saints. The Greek word all occurs four times in this verse. Prayer should be public and private, deliberate, spontaneous, supplication, intercession, confession, on it goes. Okay, verse 19, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. This is Paul asking for prayer that he might be more bold. There's Mr. Chutzpah himself. Pray for me that utterance may be given me that I may open my mouth boldly. You've got to be kidding. Twice he and his fishly says, fearlessly, and the mystery of the gospel. Now he would go, he was surely going to go on trial before Caesar. And he's praying pardon in case his Jewish accusers would uh, make charges against him. See, this epistle was written in Rome. And the Romans looked upon the Christians as a sect of the Jews. And the Jews considered them a heretical group. And so in Paul's trial, he needed to make it clear that Christians were neither a Jewish sect nor a heretical group, but a new entity, the church, the body of Christ, composed of Jewish and Gentile believers. And this is why he refers to it as the mystery of the gospel. That's the mystery of the gospel. We cover that in chapter 2 and 3. And this is the reason he was in bondage in Rome. It was over that issue. And there are lots of references. They'll be in the notes. And then Paul can, you know, he says, For which I am ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. The armor of God, all the individual pieces, you need them all. Review them at your leisure. But maybe not directly armor. I'd call it artillery, but there's prayer. And he, he closes that on that. Crucial, crucial instruction. This is not tangential. This is not extracurricular. This is not an elective part of the Bible. This is a command that your spiritual survival and effectiveness and fruit-bearing depends upon. 
being strong, and by studying these things, following through, and uh, springboarding from this brief review into your own study. Spiritual warfare, you're in it. Are you equipped? Are you prepared? Are you going to take it seriously? Very important. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we just praise you tonight. We thank you, Father, that you have cared so much about us as to give us your word. We pray, Father, that you would draw each of us ever more deeply into your word, that we each might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, that we each might be better equipped to face the battle that surrounds us. We pray, Father, that you would indeed draw us, train us, strengthen us to be your effective stewards of these gifts. We pray, Father, that you would help each of us also to discover that unique ministry you have for each of us in these days, that we each might ever be more responsive to your will in our lives and more effective stewards of those gifts that you've given us, not by power nor by might, but by your Spirit, Father. For we commit ourselves in these things before you in the name of Yeshua, HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.